Okay, so this is uh, Monica Meyer presenting on fostering independence and autonomy at home, school, and work. And we just were discussing identity first and people first. Sometimes we say an autistic person, or sometimes we say person with autism. All right. All right. Thank you. So I just wanted to kind of, kind of give you a brief overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. And it looks like a very healthy agenda, but it goes pretty quick. Um, and so the first is the overview of autism. And then an overview of what independence and relationship development, lifelong learning, why is independence challenging for autistic adults, such as organizational skills, executive function, intellect, or co and cognitive or cognitive ability has no correlation with executive function. Then talk about support strategies that foster and cultivate independence, such as visual supports in a multiple multitude of ways. The principles, principles to independence, structure predictability, examples of visual supports, uh, medical model versus social model of support, and more. And if you could set a timer, I'd like to take like a five minute break after an hour and a half. So at um, <laughs> seven o'clock, if that works, I was like, what time is it? Could you set a timer for that, Amelia? I would appreciate it very much. I just had like a quart of water and I know <laughs> I I won't, I'm not going to last three hours. And I'm going so, to disappear briefly to get a, a water, but I can hear you. I'll be right back half a second. All right. Thank you. So within the autism field, you're going to hear autism, neurodivergent, uh, neurodiverse, autistic. Um, as I said, you know, people first language was uh, preferred within the autism community um, in order to avoid implications that a person was literally defined by their autism. Um, its intent was and has been uh, to have people seen as a person and not as a disability. So again, talking about per people first language, um, and then like I said, the autism community um, made with many self-advocates and with typically without intellectual disabilities, which would be different from what my son experiences. Um, and their allies preferred terminology as autistic, um, autistic person, autistic in individual. Um, and like I said, I will use both of those today as we have now stated that three times. <laughs> so I'm always trying to move things around so I can see things. So to look at uh, first is the dyad of impairment. And this is that we're going to be talking about really the characteristics of autism. And uh, I want to say, what is this? It must have been 2018. So it's been about five years ago that the Diagnostic St Statistical Manual, um, the DSM, as people refer to, had a reauthorization. So they have uh, edition five. It went from a triad of, in of impairment to a dyad of impairment. And that dyad of impairment means there are two pillars, basically, when we talk about um, the diagnosis of autism. And that is, uh, first, a persistent deficit in social communication social interaction across multiple contexts as manifested by, we'll get into those, um, some of the deficits as the rest of this training we'll be talking about, and a restrictive repertoire of behaviors, um, interests, activities uh, manifested at least two or more of, uh, of a person's history again, that we'll get into such as stereo, stereo, stereotypical or repetitive movements. Uh, it might be that um, the insistence on sameness, it might be a person who's hyper or hypo uh, uh, reactive to different sensory processing. They might have uh, highly um, restricted uh, foods, interests, 
uh, that they focus on, um, you know, strong attach attachment to or with a preoccupation with certain objects, et cetera. So we're going to get into, you know, a little more in depth what those characteristics mean um, as we continue on. And you will hear me again refer to the diet of impairment. So you think of the social communication and what had happened before the previous uh, DSM, which was the DSM-4, had identified uh, autism as a triad of impairment, that there was social and communication and a re restricted repertoire behaviors. But in the wise um, interest of individuals who make those rules, um, they to be social, you need to communicate. And to communicate, you need to be social. So they said, we're putting um, basically social communication as one um, one of the dyad, um, one of the impairments that's related to the dyad of impairments. So what is autism? Well, autism, it's a developmental disability it's, uh, that is lifelong and typically appears within the first three years of life. Autism is a neurological uh, disorder that affects the functioning of the brain, and it is not an emotional or psychological disorder, although it can co-occur with a emotional, psychological, or mental illness. It is a standalone neurological disorder. It is five times more common in boys than in girls, which really kind of tags onto the conversation that we had at the beginning is that there are more... Um, more, more information about boys um, than there are girls because there are less girls that actually, obviously with um, uh, five to one, uh, less girls who have autism than they do boys. And girls typically are diagnosed much later in life. Sometimes it's not until they hit middle school when um, the structure and predictability, the structure and predictability of a of an elementary school goes to the idea or the really the ideals of middle school, which is how to be social, how do we, how do we interact within a community? Um, autism knows no boundaries um, and has been found throughout the world in families of all racial, ethnic, and social backgrounds with the same, um, basically the, the same ratio um, that we'll be discussing here in just a minute. So looking at this diet of impairment, the social communication deficits and the restricted repertoire behaviors, which is, are the dark, two dark blue circles, there are, as I had mentioned before, coexisting or comorbid diagnoses um, that are part, uh, that it also co-occur with an autism diagnosis, such as a person, may have autism and an intellectual disability, or they may have autism without a, an intellectual disability. Um, a person may have autism and a language disability, may have seizures, GI uh, disorders, uh, immune dysfunction. You might have a person who has autism with um, irritability, with um, having traumas, aggression, or self-infliction or self-injurious behaviors. Um, you might have somebody who's uh, autism with um, sleep difficulties or deficits, um, moods, anxiety, hyperactivity or hypoactivity and attention. So the core clinical features are the dark blue and then the associated um, neurological symptoms and uh, are in the gray. And then when we look at the associated physical symptoms like GI disorders and immune deficits are in kind of the gold color. So autism is a standalone neurological disorder, although can co-occur and often does have co-occurring um, diagnosis. Uh, and, you know, I, I guess I'm going to jump back for just a second because um, why why the clarity in this is because there um in the field that i work in primarily is in the field of uh developmental disabilities administration which most people 
uh, within DDA services need to qualify uh, for services based on an IQ of below 70. And so you can have a person with autism that can have an IQ of at a genius level. So oftentimes what happens is many people, um, they want to support, instruct, uh, or teach a person with autism as if they have only an intellectual disability. And what happens is that autism has specific support strategies that are best practices that meet the needs of a person who has autism, which is the, um, the primary um, disability, neurological dis uh, disability, that oftentimes support strategies that work for an, um, a neurotypical person or a person who only has an intellectual disability um, will not get the support needs uh, met because there are, it differentiates itself uh, completely from a person um, who does not have autism. So a little bit of that explained. So when you look at autism, I would say it's not really, you'll hear that it's not really a linear uh, process. It used to be people would say, well, are they high functioning? Are they low functioning? When actually it's been really um, a really eye-opening um, process of having people understand that it's a continuum. It exists on a continuum, a continuum, excuse me. And as I mentioned before, does coexist with other disabilities, such as an intellectual disability, deafness, blindness, Down syndrome, bipolar, uh, cerebral palsy, just to name a few. Um, the significant differences um, from an intellectual disability and a mental illness, um, but can and often does co-occur with other disabilities. So when you look at the term high functioning and low functioning, they are harmful and are not really used anymore. So rather than saying a person is less autistic or they're very autistic, um, what we wanna do is the autism spectrum looks more like, it, it's not just on the left that it's either one or the other. It is like a pie, but the pie pieces are very different. So you might have somebody who is very routine bound, but they're very social, I mean, the only thing is that they don't understand maybe social boundaries, but they are social, um, but they might have difficulty with communication, executive function, so um, or a preoccupation or um, sensory processing difficulties. So it isn't a term of, you know, are they high or low functioning? It is a process of typically saying, um, you know, have a, a loved one that has autism, who is verbal versus a person who might say, I have a son or daughter, a loved one who um, has autism and an intellectual disability. And if people wanna know what that means, then they'll ask. Um, and that is that is the one thing um, that you will find <laughs> is when you, it's interesting because being immersed in, you know, developmental disabilities, since my son's birth um, and his subsequent diagnosis of autism, it has been a process of always being his, uh, his advocate. And basically he has had the, he, had, he has had the task of being the ambassador um, for autism and helping the community understand what autism and look like and what forms autism can take. And um, whether you want to or not, so will your, so will your loved ones be that, um, be that ambassador, which I'm hoping within my lifespan <laughs> that our kids won't always have to be the ones that are pushing the doors open and saying, I do belong. Rather, of course you belong. How can we help you? That would be that's my hope and dream um, for the next however many years that I'm on this earth. So what makes autism different from other, let's say a child, an employment candidate, a community inclusion specialist, um, customer or a resident? 
is that, you know, the characteristics of autism, as I mentioned, fall on a continuum that a person may have communication and language problems. Um, like I said, communication, communication um, can take many forms, but it's um, oftentimes people think communication uh, is language when communication doesn't have to be language. Language just happens to be um, the process that we'll be able to express ourselves. So if you're speaking, you know, you I, I speak English, so that is my language. Though a person who is deaf might use American Sign Language. So communication can take many forms. And that being said, there are problems related to that. We have social related judgment perspectives, boundaries, um, and I'll get into that as we get through this um, this uh, training today is the social relating, understanding the perspective from, from other people's point of view, such as maybe um, understanding that somebody has a different thought than I do, that, um, that I maybe because I was really um, perhaps too concrete, maybe even to the point of a person might thinking I was being too blunt, um, that that somebody I hurt somebody's feeling. Again, these are the social relating issues, uh, judgment. Uh, those are the things that we'll get into here in just a few minutes. Restricted repertoire behaviors, upset by change in say a staff, a teacher, their environment, and oftentimes free time is the most difficult for a person with autism because they memorize the world, they have routines, and they're very easily upset and confused when things change. Um, cognitive or intellectual hindrances, that could be somebody who's a very concrete literal thinker, I have difficulty integrating ideas or concepts, um, knowing the difference between what's relevant and irrelevant, may have troubles with choices, can be very indecisive, then we're gonna be talking about organization and sequencing problems. And that is oftentimes related to executive function problems um, that a person doesn't know where to start. Um, what's next? How long am I gonna be doing this? What am I finished? Um, they don't know how to organize themselves sometimes just to get out the door. Maybe having uh, scattered or uneven, um, uneven skills of development. So you might have somebody who's really good at numbers and routines, but have problem with language and abstract reasoning. You might have a person who has an intellectual disability and may have a, a, an IQ below um, 70 and yet reads at a college level. It doesn't mean that they have comprehension, but they can certainly read the words. And um, oftentimes people get confused with that. And you might have a person with a, uh, with autism who is not able to speak and they all they might have a uh, even to the point of having a savant uh, characteristic or a very high IQ so you just it's not a process of trying to you know stick a pin in this because i need to know or figure out where they lie on this spectrum it like i said it's like a pie and sometimes you again like i said talking when i uh, describe my son, like I said, you know, I have a son with autism and an intellectual disability. I might even say I have a son with autism who has, uh, who needs very um, substantial supports in his life. And then people say, oh, I get that. Or it might be, I, you know, uh, somebody who's self-advocating that can say, you know, I have autism. I don't need a lot of supports, but I, I know and understand that I do have an, uh, an autism spectrum disorder. So according to the CDC, and that was just, this just came out in March of 2023, the, um, the monitoring net network uh, that measures the prevalence of autism and the diagnosis, um, that little red mark is supposed to be up over the 44, not across disabilities. <laughs> I don't know how it moved, but it did. So it is one in 37 children, um, that are being identified with an autism spectrum disorder, according to the estimates of the CDC and the Autism Developmental Disabilities Monitoring, which is the ADDM 
um, as of March of this year. If you want to know more about that, I have provided a link. And that being said, um, I have the handout for this uploaded to Google uh, Docs, and I'll send you that link here just at, at the break time, Malia. So you can see, and um, why this important, this is um, maybe astonishing, is that when my son was born, the prevalence of autism was one to two in 10,000. Now we're looking at one in 37. 10,037, and some people say, well, they have better diagnosticians, we have better this and that. Um, you know, I've worked with birth to three, I've worked um, in three to five, I've worked in the school systems, I've worked in adult systems. And I can tell you as of, you know, really 2010, the adult service um, agencies are have felt the tsunami of the number of people with autism coming into um, adult services, whether it is mental health, uh, mental health services, whether it's DVR or supported employment through um, our Developmental Disabilities Administration. So- Do you feel comfortable sharing what year he was born? <laughs> sure, he was born in 1983. So he- That is, really wasn't that long ago. No, no, I mean- <laughs> Not at all. I mean, that's, and what I, you know, even thinking about that, I mean, Michael was born in 83. Um, when you think about, you know, the, the process of even children having access to schools really only changed in the early eighties. So he, although he was born in the eighties, the he didn't have any problems getting into school, but it wasn't until 1991 that the, um, through the Americans with Disability Act, the Individuals with Disability Educational Act didn't come to fruition until 1991. Then it was reauthorized in 1997. But prior to all that, it was in, I want to say, 1974, that public law, public law, 91, 94, oh, 92, good Lord, 94, 142. No, no. 94. Wasn't it 1973? Because I'm born in 74. The 1973 right. IDEA, or is it the 504 Rehabilitation Act? I just That's posted it because it's yeah, it was 50 years ago. Right. That was the ADA. Yeah. And then there is how the idea of having people in with developmental disabilities within the school system started again, right about the same time with public law 94-142, which again was with the advocacy of families that worked towards um, having children have access to free and, appropriate, free and appropriate public education, just as any other person. So within a very short period of time, we've literally Although it seems when I look in hindsight, it's like, holy cow, we're just seeming like we take three steps forward and two steps back. But considering where things were, you know, almost 40 years ago, my son will be 40 in December, is we've come a long way. So, and I've already talked about this, you know, the diagnostic statistical manual, the DSM-5, um, that there are, well, I talked about the DSM-5, but the DSM-5 currently recognizes five different autism subtypes or specifiers. Specifiers. Before it was like this big umbrella term that was PDD NOS, which is a pervasive developmental disability, uh, not otherwise specified. It was um, high functioning autism, Asperger's. It was all these things when the DSM-5 said, you know, similar to when a person is pregnant, they're pregnant, regardless of you know <laughs> when they conceived or not, they're pregnant. It's kind of like the same thing. If you have autism, you have autism, but there are subtypes and specifiers that go with that. So they are with or without an accompanying intellectual impairment, with or without an accompanying language impairment, with or without an, uh, or associated with a known medical or genetic condition or environmental factor, which 
that um, there was a lot of, there was research, and I want to say it was in the early 90s, and it was a, a township in New Jersey that identified within this uh, close proximity of like, uh, like a 20 mile radius, there were almost, uh, there was probably, I mean, the word, the number 35 comes to my head, but I'm sure it wasn't that specific, but close to 35 children um, were diagnosed within a five year period of time of having autism and an intellectual disability. So that's when we talk about, gosh, is there an, an environmental factor? Well, most, yes. And oftentimes, um, well, actually the prevalence of autism, even what the CDC takes happens to be um, in states that are either in the Rust Belt or in um, states that have um, oil refineries. Um, there's a lot of environmental things that uh, do cont uh, contribute to environmental issues um, that have to be things that perhaps trigger an autism spectrum disorder uh, while mom or dad, uh, mom or dad, while mom um, or the mother has been, was pregnant and um, was exposed to those. And then right. it could be dad because there's a correlation of the age of the father. You are right. You're, you're absolutely right. I was talking about carrying, carrying the child, but absolutely it can be because we know that both the egg and the sperm can carry any factor that has been environmentally um, exposed that can um, pass on to a child. But there really hasn't been anything other than there is a cluster of genes that researchers have shown that have, um, that they know isn't um, correlate to a, an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. They haven't yet really, that's what they're working on is how does that, how does that work out? How do we tease out all that information? And I can tell you uh, when my son at the age of 35 was diagnosed with a genetic disorder that had only been identified in uh, 2012. So he, it, you know, that that's only 11 years ago. So the majority of people diagnosed with what is referred to as SYNGAP1, which is a neurological um, genetic disorder. Um, Michael at the time of diagnosis was the oldest um, to be diagnosed with SYNGAP1. Um, he actually happens to be of the 3% in the world that have um, age-wise that have SYNGAP1 who have been diagnosed. Um, so it's been this, it's, you know, when you think, well, just as when uh, Lori was saying that her daughter was just recently diagnosed in her thirties, it was like, just when you think it's okay to go back in the water, I mean, it's like, holy cow, all of a sudden it's got, I got another diagnosis. And that I think is what we'll be continually um, experiencing over the next few years, because there has been finally really good attention um, brought to autism. And so then um, the uh, another subtype or specifier would be associated with another neuro neurodevelopment neurodevelopmental disorder, um, you know, such as maybe cerebral palsy or a mental health condition um, such as uh, bipolar or um, a generalized anxiety disorder. My son has a generalized anxiety disorder or a behavioral disorder, uh, which isn't uh, necessarily related to a communication deficit, that there, mu there might be uh, something that is related to, um, you know, anger, social emotional regulation, things that really produce um, maybe perhaps aggression or self-injurious behavior. And then we have another uh, specifier that is an autism spectrum disorder with catatonia. So just like I was just talking about, you know, the causes of autism is that there is, there is at least, well, and, and this is probably old information because um, it's probably, this is, this webinar is about two years old, <laughs> my slides. So there, there might be more information, but 
um, at the time there was anywhere between 15 to 25 percent of people with autism had a um, there was an inherent uh, relationship that there was more than one person in uh, in their family who had autism. Then we have the genetic factors, similar to what I was uh, referred to with my son, who happens to have a SYNGAP1 um, diagnosis uh, or genetic syndrome. And then there's fragile X. There are um, others that, that really um, describe how the person um, really experiences their the the characteristics of autism. It was interesting when I did get the like the genetic um testing done for my son. And it was all not because I wanted to know more about his autism. It was actually because he has an intractable seizure disorder, which means that he has uncontrollable seizures, um, even with four medications and a um vagus nerve stimulator that has been implanted into his chest that actually stimulates his vagus nerve that um, basically when a seizure uh, happens that the nerve is stimulated so he doesn't necessarily have a drop seizure or he he's not likely to hurt himself um, although he still has breakthrough seizures with all of it that was the reason why we had the, the genetic study um, because there are certain uh, types of epilepsy that there are um, gene therapy that can be used to actually be re reverse the effects of some epilepsy. Unfortunately, Michael didn't fall into those, but we found out that he did have a um, genetic disorder called SYNGAP1. And we, when I started reading about it, I was like, that they have autism, that they have an intellectual disability, that they have an intractable seizure disorder, that they have aggression. And, you know, the list went on and I was like, oh my gosh, they're just describing him. I mean, it was, it was uh, kind of surreal. And then we have other issues that, you know, the cause of autism could be medical problems, could be something related to something that happens um, while in vitro, or it could be something that happens as a, um, as a result of a, uh, of a child, just as you were talking about Malia is, you know, long-term, uh, COVID, um, what do you call it? Not long-term, a oh, long-term effects of COVID could be one of the medical problems that can within that first three years of year, three years of life can trigger, um, really the, uh, the characteristics of autism. And then there are uh, certain uh, viruses, although I just spoke about COVID, that really isn't one of the viruses that specifically causes autism. It just happens that some of the um, long-term effects of COVID are neurological um, versus the person who might have a, verse, uh, a virus that let's say, um, you know, measles, mumps, those types of things, those viruses, there have been some uh, people who have decided not to have a um, immunization. And I'm not gonna say whether I'm for or against, um, but there are some people that feel that uh, adding a, a virus to a, a newborn child uh, who has already a compromised immune system that that there are some families, some people that feel that um, that there is no wonder um, that we have children who um, who have neurological dis um, problems, whether it's with autism or not. Again, just going back to her, um, heredity and genetics, patterns of autism or related disabilities in a family. Like I said, one or two, um, not one or two, two or more. Um, there was a, a a study done out of University of Was Washington done by, I think it was in 2005 by Geraldine Dawson, um, Dr. Geraldine Dawson, and she was doing studies on twins, uh, twins that have both child, both children who have autism and children that have one sibling that has autism and the other one doesn't, that there was a, a lot of um, research done on that 
um, she went from University of Washington and uh, started working in research for Autism Speaks. But what we do know is there isn't just one gene. Um, there is a cluster and there is uh, research that is searching for irregular segments of a genetic code that children with autism may have inherited. And looking back again in my family is I had, um, uh, since my oldest brother, he was uh, a person with autism who was not diagnosed. He should have and would have been diagnosed at, if he had lived. And he died at uh, the age of 33 um, of a cerebral hemorrhage. Just knowing what I do now, it was like, for heaven's sakes, of course he had autism. I also had, um, I had two cousins, um, one on my mom's side and one on my dad's side, both with autism. So, you know, not to make light of it, but there, you know, there wasn't a, say, uh, a lifeguard at our gene pool there. We have quite a few people with, um, with autism in my, um, in my genetic code. So, uh, we know that children are born with the disorder or born with the potential to develop it and develop it. And that's where, again, a lot of people who feel that um, because they have the potential to develop it, that um, there are, you know, the anti-vaxxers that are really pushing in saying, if they have the potential to develop it, why would we introduce, you know, a live virus into a growing compromised brain and neurological system? Then we also know it's not caused by bad parenting because unfortunately in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, there was still a mindset that autism was caused by a bad parent, that they um, that there was a, a section of people, moms in particular, that were identified as uh, being refrigerator mothers. And if you're familiar with Temple Grandin, um, she happens to be an ambassador for autism and has been for nearly 40 years, that she is a person um, who, although she, she does have autism, she still needs some supports and she has three to uh, four degrees. Um, one is um, that she has a doctorate in animal husbandry. So like I said, we can't make any sort of um, uh, decisions on where a person may or may not fall on the autism spectrum. Kimberly can we, has. Oh, uh, can we circle back to the viruses? Um, if there's, because I haven't heard of, I know that the Andrew Wakefield research was pulled and it was because he was yep. trying to develop his own vaccine, which is why right. he wrote up that false um, scientific research. But what you're saying is, sounds new to me about the vaccines. Is there like, is there investigation into that now or studies? There, there has been, if you go actually, um, go to University of Washington under autism research, Geraldine Dawson, or to um, Autism Speaks, because we do know um, viral, viral infections that are related to neurological disorders, such as autism, um, <clears throat> are neuro-related diseases um, by viral infections include measles, meningitis, post-infectious um, encephalo encephalo encephalomyelitis, <laughs> excuse me, subacute sclerosis, um, panis, um, it's pancreas, pana, panacephalitis, chicken pox, and polio. So as autism is a neural related, um, a neurological disorder, any neural related diseases um, related, I mean, to those viruses um, are subject to uh, a diagnosis of, of autism. Does that answer that? Yeah, you gave us some uh, avenues to hunt down. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me. I will put. Let me see if I can. I will do that at the break. I'll I'll take a um. This was actually this is details out of their neuro neurological care. Let me see, out of uh, University of Nebraska ne Nebraska Medical Center, who's done that research. University of uh, Missouri has also done a lot of research on autism. That's another place to look at. Um, autism, like I said, Autism Speaks, specifically uh, Geraldine Dawson. That would be a good one to look at as well. So when we get on break, I will put that um, also. And so I just wanted to look at the chat. Um, Malia, you had said that um, you can you can trace our your basically your lineage of autism back to your great grand your great grandpa as being a farmer um and when you look at a lot of the industrial things that have happened you know that we have OSHA regulations for that you know even you know 30 40 years ago we didn't have um regulations on a lot of things that actually have um impaired people um, and as they they understand now that you know we even know that trauma can um, be impacted into our can affect our genetic code. Any exposures can uh, 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 exposures to chemicals, overexposure to chemicals, not just exposure, overexposure to chemicals can have an impact on our genetic code, and that can be three to four generations later. So there's, I mean. If it, if the outcome wasn't so uh, that a, a person um, like, and I would say for my son with autism, who is um, heavily impacted by his autism, would I have wanted to know this information? Would it would have been, you know, his life would have been a lot different. I love him for who he is and for everything that. Um, but I, if I could take all that away from him, I would in a heartbeat. Um, Kimberly had asked, do you have research to share any of this research? Oh, sorry, yes. I've never seen anything about vaccines, only research that was quickly pulled. Yeah. So like I said, just, I will send you that information on the break. Well, actually probably after, not on the break because I'm gonna be running to use the restroom. So <laughs> I'll do that at the very end. Actually, I'll send it to what I usually do is I send those things to Malia and then Malia, Malia has the registration and your emails and she will forward that on to you. Whatever the cause that we know of autism, that children with autism or the children with born with autism um, are born with the disorder or born with the potential of developing. Oh, I already said that. Blah, 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 blah. Go on. Um, Autism, not a mental, mental health disorder. Anxiety disorders uh, affect up to 42% of people with autism. By contrast, anxiety disorders affect an estimate of 3% of children and 15% of adults in the general population. So anxiety is a at least 50%, close to 50% of people um, who have autism also have an anxiety disorder. And this is something I'd referenced um, before is despite some um, similarities between autism and an intellectual disability, um, there are several important differences. And that would be one, a person has autism or an autistic person has an IQ of 70 below, but we know that autism is a pervasive developmental disability that needs to be addressed first before we look at the intellectual disabilities because an intellectual disability means that there is a learning, um, there's a learning deficit. And if you don't understand autism, um, best practice um, educational supports will not work for a person with autism, that there has to be a, a different way of uh, presenting information for the person to have um, good good information that they can um, have 
be able to learn and be able to uh, recall it. And so, like I said, there is a difference. And if you have a, a son or a daughter, a loved one who has autism and an intellectual disability, um, you'll want to pay close attention to what we're going to be talking about uh, later in this presentation, as well as those who may not have an intellectual disability that may have a mental health dis uh, disorder, et cetera. So I can't, I get ahead of myself because I've done this training so, so many times. So I've already said, you know, how's the different? It is varies in IQ range with both above and below. Um, and in fact, it's quite common for people with, um, I would, I even put severe autism in here. I've got to check that. I got to fix that. Uh, so a person with uh, autism who have, who have high acuity support needs, um, have an IQ of 70 or below, while some people may have high IQs, while a small population are considered genius or savant levels. And this differs from people with an intellectual, intellectual disability who generally have an IQ of 70 or below with a global delay um, that is different from a person with autism. And I got to check the next uh, slide because I'm going to know I'm going to get into it, is that um, it's almost, do I have it in here? No, let me step back. So it's almost like when you have a person who has autism versus a person with a intellectual disability, oops, come back here, is that oftentimes um, there, uh, when you start evaluating the person's aptitudes, skills, um, deficits, et cetera, one of the things that was really difficult for I would say specifically school psychologists at the very beginning is um, when we when autism was really coming to the forefront is that uh, a child may have a um, like I said a reading aptitude of a um, of a senior in high school and yet the person doesn't have executive functioning to be able to tie their own shoes or you might have uh, a person who can- You just, just described my daughter. Oh, <laughs> right. She has an IQ of one, 143 or something, but still cannot tie your shoes. She's 11. Exactly. Needs a lot of prompts. Yeah. <laughs> so it is, it almost looks like, you know, kind of like an EKG because it it is not global as a person with an intellectual disability, they tend to have a global delay over all skills and aptitudes of learning that is equal from one to another, uh, which is, that is not the uh, the case for a person with autism because it's not gonna look uh, anything close to it. And like I had mentioned, my son, uh, Michael has an intellectual disability and I remember when they were, when he was in middle school, that they decided to do an IQ test, although it was against my, um, my wishes. Uh, <laughs> but um, the school psychologist gave him a, an IQ of 35, which is extremely low, extremely low. I can't, I, I can't have any, I don't even, I, I, at any rate, and then the school psychologist said, but interestingly enough, he's got a comprehension of the sixth grader. So he's only one year behind in reading comprehension. It's like, and it's like, he said, I did you a favor though. So you he can get social security later in life. And I said, well, you didn't do me a favor because this really does not give a good representation of, of what he can do. Um, so at any rate, like I said, you, uh, well, I'll give another example. I was at a conference some years ago, the Autism Society of America. Temple Grandin was speaking and Temple Grandin's mom, her name is Eustacia Cutler. And she talked about, she was actually one of the mothers that was re, um, regarded as a refrigerator mother that um, she was unfeeling and didn't love her child, which was so far from the truth. Um, that we had moms talk about it. And then we had a panel of adults with autism that um, they were going to present. And 
they had a PowerPoint presentation. And as I was sitting there, I mean, we had people rock back and forth and chewing on things. Um, others that were turned around and would not face the, the audience. And all of them had PhDs. At first glance, you would not have known that this person had um, any sort of intellectual aptitude when we cannot make just by looking at a person, we should not make any snap decisions about their abilities or not, because you're going to be surprised. And especially a person who falls anywhere on the autism spectrum, because um, what they might know in one area, it's just going to be like, holy cow. And in another a area, like, you know, Malia, you just said your daughter can be, have a, you know, an IQ of over 140 and she can't put her shoes on. I mean, those are some of the things that the the inequities, um, the inconsistencies that um, that come with this diagnosis. So we're going to get into autism independence and relationship development. Really, are the keys to success. Um, and why I'm uh, I, I'm really kind of starting with this is that. As children, um, you know, we want to be able to help our children um, learn, and that could be whether it's at home or at school, in the community, as they grow and become adults. Um, it really starts. It can. It really needs to start. You know, I always say transition from school to adult services starts at birth to three, because we need to think about how is this person. And how do we scaffold skills so this person can continue to meet um, um, certain goals within their life? And that's where, you know, making sure that whether a person has autism, um, a child has autism uh, or autism with an intellectual disability or autism and a mental health diagnosis or autism and ADHD, this person needs to be able, needs to be treated just as any other child. Um, that's what, and that's what we want for our, our, our loved ones as they enter into schools, into colleges and into adult services or adult life is that we want acceptance and we want understanding of what a person may need at any age and at every, at any level. And that really starts, um, very, like I said, very young. So independence gives us a feeling of accomplishment and, and competence, which is meaningful and motivating to all. And I'll get into, you know, when we prompt what happens when we uh, prompt a person is the desire for independence is certainly present in children and adults with autism. Um, though reaching the maximum level of independence can prove to be challenging. And I can tell you that's one of the things that I focus on are really um, residential providers, job coaches, um, DVR customers that um, I work with the agencies to be able to support the person, to help them understand how this person learns, give them tools and uh, supports that they can help this person learn and or give the person um, the autistic person with those tools so that they can do some um, social emotional regulation, some self-monitoring. Um, there's uh, technology has come such a long ways that we can certainly help our, our, our loved ones really, um, really become more independent than what was even considered possible um, in the recent past. So the paradigm shift, what we need to think about is from caregiving to being a teacher and coaching. And, you know, that's what people say, oh, are you a caregiver? And I, I want people to think, um, you know, I'm a parent, but I, I'm a, you know, I provide teaching, mentoring and coaching. Um, and what does that mean is um, I want to help facilitate my son at any age and any person to be able to continue to grow because as we all are lifelong learners, 
every human being is a lifelong learner, including um, autistic individuals. So, you know, making meals or snack, setting a table, loading and unloading a dishwasher, taking out garbage, garbage, washing and folding laundry, making their own beds, um, really involving the person in the chores in their life from a very early age. What we do know is prompt dependence um, can be a serious problem to the development of independence. And what that means is prompt dependence is often um, a deterrent to independence. And if we go back to looking at the diet of impairment, that there are the two pillars or the two um, diagnostic criteria is a, is a social communication disorder and a re uh, repetitive, repetitive patterns of behaviors. A person who is routinized, who really likes routine structure and predictability, that pillar really, when we, when we prompt a person with autism, what we're doing is that we are embedding ourselves into their life. We're not giving them, you know, it's like, do I teach a person, do I give a person a fish today or do I teach them to fish for themselves? Um, just that analogy is how do I help this person help themselves rather than doing it for them or prompting them, um, you know, working with agencies and teachers for many years as I have, you know, they'll say, well, I've told them over and over and over and over again, you know, like, can't believe it. And I'll say, well, how's that working for you? It's like, you need to change. You need your way is that you're seeking compliance rather than understanding how this person learns and how we can help that person become as independent as possible. So as I said, many adults that work with students, um, workers, residents with autism, assume that they need to help a person with autism as much as possible um, because they think that they can't do it independently. Uh, for example, a student requires hand-over-hand -hand assistant when writing his or her name um, the teacher could create a prompt fade plan that reduces that prompting. So from hand to hand to less intrusive prompt to a support of a verbal prompt, um, like stay in the lines. And then um, with a, a template that a person is able to follow that then there's eventual independence. But if you're using the same analysis or same strategy as I'm gonna tell you what to do, tell you what to do, um, that prompt dependency uh, will continue to become, will be a barrier to that person's development of independence. While it's important to keep in mind that some people uh, may have more difficulty with that than say other folks, um, independence, um, independence on certain tasks, uh, the use of least and strict uh, rest intrusive prompts should be the goal when aiming for independent functioning. As I mentioned before, <laughs> I'm always jumping ahead of myself and I apologize, <laughs> is that lifelong learning, the challenge in supporting individuals with autism rests on the shoulder of the teacher, the job coach, the support staff, the family, and in many cases, as we're talking about today, the individual. It's teaching and facilitating the use of a visual system focus on communication and process. Production work output is secondary to teaching independence. And what do I mean by that is, you know, say a teacher would say, well, you know, Stephanie did not finish her, her work page and therefore, you know, she fails. If in, in retrospect, if the teacher had said, you know, we still have work uh, with Stephanie, she was able to put her name in the right place and was able to start at the right position to get her work done. That is saying that, you know, we, it's not the work output, it's the process that we are helping that person learn independence and start with the process so that they complete it. And I'm also a very strong proponent of universal design for learning that it is that we need to change how we. Uh, support an individual that provides them the access to our um, access to learning, access to, you know, all the things that uh, a neurotypical person would um, have advantages to. 
Uh, why is independence challenging for adults with autism? So Divis Teach, uh, uh, which is out of the University of North Carolina Teach program and is services across the lifespan, lifespan ha was founded in 1972 by Dr. Eric Schopler, um, who uh, now is Gary Mesabah, who is the director of Division Teach. And what it does is understanding that um, TEACH is an acronym that I, teaching or educational um, autistic children, anyway, I can't, I don't remember the actual acronym, so I apologize. So what we're talking about is establishing independence as goal um, for a goal is vital. It's gaining an understanding of the possible barriers to independence that a, a, a child, a worker, a resident, um, a college student, et cetera, face in their life. And how do we address that? Rather than saying, I only have one, um, I only have one, um, one mode of, of teaching or training and that you're going to have to adapt to it however you can. And that is based on my way of presenting information. Although it may not meet your learning style, it is still assessed on how I present the information rather than we look at the individuals such as what Dr. Uh, Mesabov has said is that we really need to look at and have an understanding of uh, what, are the, uh, what are the possible barriers to this person's learning, independence, et cetera. Emma, there we go. So let's look at just organization. You know, what we know is a term um, that refers to the ability to produce a timely organized response when asked to do so. Again, looking at that um, diet of impairment, the restricted uh, repertoire of behaviors, organization is one of those pieces. Um, we know that there are many autistic people who demonstrate physical actions spontaneously, but they don't perform the same action in a timely way when asked to do so by another person. For example, a person may quickly um, puts his or her shoes on um, when they want to go out and do something, but when asked by a person um, does not put them on or takes a very long time to do so. Um, this is often um, interpreted as a problem of cooperation or motivation, but it can also be an indicator of exec executive function problems. The person may be unable to organize the steps and actions uh, following the request, even though she has physically been capable of performing the task in the past. Executive function is not all problem, not all people or not all, all autistic people have executive from uh, executive function deficits, but many do. Um, it is the ability to engage in an activity or task along with the mental process that makes this all possible. That's called executive function. It's that it's that ability when you look at on the right hand side of the screen is executive function helps us organize organize ourselves to complete an activity or task at school work home life that is dependent on a number of mental processes and, and that includes organization, inhibiting impulses, selective attention, sustaining and shifting activities and mental process. Um, you know, like when people say, well, <clears throat> I can multitask when a person with autism, um, I don't think anybody really does a good job of multitasking. I being one of them, um, but sustaining and shifting like Oh, like when you're doing something and then all of a sudden someone comes in, wants your attention that, oh, I can answer a question and come back to what I was doing. That is a difficult process for somebody who has executive function. You know, the planning memory, how do I plan? How do I, I'm going to go on vacation. Well, I'm just not going to go on vacation to, because I don't know where to start. A person could be very distractible, have difficulty sequencing the steps. How do I, what do I need to do? Where do I start? generalization of skills from one environment to another. You might learn it in one environment, but when asked to generalize it into another can be very difficult, which is another uh, executive function 
deficit characteristic, um, being able to generalize it um, is something that's, again, you're having to recall information, which is basically what your executive function does. It is that mental process that recalls information and gets you started on a plan. Uh, the initiation, the initiation, the initiation of a task or a process or, you know, or a vacation, whatever it is, um, can be too difficult or overwhelming or the completion of a task that I'll start something, but I don't finish it. So I'll start something else. These are all related to executive function, which oftentimes are also related to ADD and ADHD. But when you think of ADD and ADHD as being part of the neurodivergent family, executive function is also one of those um, areas that you need that is considered in those areas as well. So what we also know is intellect or a person's cognitive ability has no correlation with a person's executive function. Um, and again, I just going back to your daughter, Malia, the fact that she has an IQ of 140 and yet doesn't know how to put her shoes on, that is an executive function process and not motivation or not that she doesn't have the ability to do it. She is not, she can't organize the sequence, especially if she has something else on her mind that she needs to be doing. So executive function uh, difficulties can be little, uh, sort of like a computer that has a good pro programming processor and good files um, with a completely compromised output device, like saying the printer is not working and the monitor is on the blink. Um, you might have, you know, all, everything is working inside the computer, but how it's demonstrated or displayed is on the blink. So if you kind of think of it that way, um, you know, that's what executive function um, is about. A person, um, an autistic person may be quite intelligent, um, IQ wise, because like I said, intelligence and cognitive ability has no correlation with uh, a person's ability uh, to organize a sequence or executive function. Um, but what it might be at a, that a person has an undeveloped or underdeveloped executive function process. When this happens, the, the individual may score low on an IQ test, similar to what my son did. Many people with autism are smarter and more capable than they appear. And when their executive function is improved or accommodated with technology or supports, they can show their skills and ability to uh, uh, and abilities greater um, to a greater advantage. And if you're familiar with the Autism Support Network, it is um, it is designed by um, autistic individuals. And so if you're interested, the Autism Support Network is good. I, I did put in as an example of a woman, she, when I start, when I knew her, she was a young child, she was 10 years old. And part of the work I did with school districts is I provided a five day structure teach program, which is part of Division Teach, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And we had um, usually four to five teams of anywhere between six to eight um, participants. Jenna was one of our students that one of the teams worked with. And what Jenna would do is that she would sit on the floor and she would, she had poker chips that she would just pick up and drop and pick up and drop. And um, without giving the the um, this group that was to work with Jenna, um, a lot of information, what we wanted to do is see where they would start looking for her um, capacities and um, her where her skills lie. They didn't do that. And they made an assumption that Jenna had a much lower IQ than she did. And you're gonna see um, if you wanted to look at <clears throat> um, at that is Jenna Lombard. She's a nonverbal autistic author. Um, she she self-taught herself to read and that was through, mm, it was, oh, good golly. She learned how to um, get onto Barnes and Noble and Barnes and Noble took her to the rest of the world based on her access to the computer. 
people didn't, they just thought she was just, you know, messing around. It wasn't until she started, she got, she had a keyboard and she had, um, oh, her name is Janet Milhouse. And she'll, she'll, she has spoken about in this um, book that Jenna wrote. And actually there's a newspaper clipping about her as well, that she helped her learn how to type in keyboard. And um, during this training that I had, <clears throat> They had set up different tasks for her using structured teaching values of um, what work, where do I work, how much work, what does finish look like, and what's next. And what they designed for her was something very, um, somebody who had a very low, um, low skill level. And Jenna got to the table after they were able to get her transitioned from the floor over to the table to work on some tasks that Jenna just took her hand and swiped everything off the table, much to their shock and surprise. And that's when <clears throat> Janet, um, her um, paraeducator, she opened up Jenna's um, keyboard and she basically told everyone off in, in on her team that how dare you think that I am not a person with, you know, with a great aptitude or a great intelligence level. And she just went on and on. Um, and like I said, it was, they looked at her and based their ideals, uh, their idea of what her, what her capacities were when in fact, um, she had a lot more going on. And one of the things that she had really was her ability to initiate to start something that was something related to your executive function. So why do students or why do autistic people uh, face unique challenges when learning is that organizational skill and executive function? Let's just say you're in a classroom and the teacher says, all right, everyone, I need you to take out, I don't, you know, now I'm aging myself. I need you to take out a piece of paper, put your name on the left, top left-hand side um, and start uh, numbering one through 10, uh, having a space in between each of them. You might have the person get a piece of paper out. That's as far as I got. Because it doesn't mean that they don't have the capacity to do it. They don't have the organizational information that is visual for that person to complete the, ta the task. So that person has difficulty with distractibility, you know, the sequencing of steps, the generalization of skills from one environment to another, the initiation of a task or the completion of a task. Visual supports help a person organize, calm the impulses, um, selective attention um, is reduced, sustaining and shifting attention um, is a, much easier to do when you have a visual support. It gets you back to where you're supposed to be. Planning, uh, your planning memory. Um, what do I need to do and how do I put that in order? It helps reduce re distractibility. It helps the person uh, sequence the steps on how to do something. Similar to, you know, when we look at a, a recipe, it tells you step-by-step step how to do it. That's what visual supports do for somebody who has difficulty with it, with executive function. It generalized, it has the ability to generalize of a skill from one environment to another, because believe it or not, a visual support can go with that person wherever they go. Helps the person know where to initiate a task and know when the task is completed. And as I mentioned before, you know, really the five components to um, independence based on the research since uh, 1972 by Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, University of North Carolina is the the pieces that a person has difficulty with is initiating, where do I work? And that work could be <clears throat> anything from starting the laundry, setting the table, um, starting uh, my thesis. It's that process of where do I start? I mean, what is it? What am I being asked to do? And then well, first it should be the other way around. What work, where do I work? So is it, you know, I've had, um, you know, students that they are, you know, slouching over their chair and kind of writing on their desk. 
<clears throat> when they have sensory issues, when in fact, it's like, if you need to work on the, on the floor, that's great. Um, but knowing where do they work or for a, um, and I'll get into that in just a couple of minutes is the person that, um, that checks in to work <clears throat> and now they don't know where to go next. And so it helps that person understand what's the next step. Because when a person's anxiety starts to get higher, their ability to organize and sequence becomes more compromised. So then, you know, how much work, how much work do I need to do before I know I'm finished? And then what does finished look like? And then from that, what do I do next? I, this just reminded me of the time I asked my daughter to take the clothes out of the laundry. Uh huh. She did. She took them out of the dryer and put them in the basket and left them there. Right. I didn't I tell her to bring them in, fold mm -hmm. them, put them away. It's, it's she's like, I did what you asked. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's a concrete, literal thinker. <laughs> <laughs> and what you had in your mind is there's a whole sequence to this and you inferred it rather than giving her specific directions. Exactly. That's a good example. Thank you, Malia. So we know that physical structure of an environment tells the worker where to work. Visual supports um, or visual schedules and routines tells the, per, uh, the worker what the day looks like for them. Visual work system tells the person how to do the work. Uh, using templates helps the worker with the placement of where things belong. Uh, jigs helps the worker with possible barriers to completing a task. There are a lot of things that we can put into place rather than prompting, 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 because I can tell you that with just, um, just with the suggestion of saying, how would you instruct your loved one? Let's just if you could do just, just bear with me, <laughs> go to chat that's in your, um, your dashboard and it will give you, um, basically, you know, you can open up your chat. If you could just think for, let's give you 30 seconds to write down the first three steps to brushing your teeth. So if each of you could do that from, from all of you that are attending, that would be great. So just the first three steps, you don't have to do it all, just first three steps. How would you teach a person uh, by prompting? Just about another 15 seconds. If you could write that um, in your in your chat, that would be great. It will be very helpful to demonstrate what it what I'm um, what I'm talking about. So Okay, so we have, you know, one, two, three, four, just, um, and thank you for, for participating. So let's just look at the first step. So Kimberly said, walk in the bathroom. Lori said, get toothbrush, put toothpaste on it. Malia says, put a small dollop of paste onto the toothbrush. Sonia said, assuming we are already in the bathroom, get a toothbrush well, get a toothbrush wet. Was that consistent between the four people? So how are we going to teach a person a routine when we all have a different way of starting? 
So let's look at step two. Um, Kimberly says, get your toothbrush. Lori says, put toothpaste on the toothbrush. Malia says, rinse quickly underwater and uh, turn water off. Sonia says, put toothpaste on the toothbrush. How about that? Did any four of you actually had the same step, the same um, process? And then lastly, Kimberly says, get the toothpaste out. Lori says, insert toothbrush into the mouth. Malia says, to brush teeth. And then Sonia said, brush teeth in circles. So if we have, you know, let's just say three different people in this person uh, and an autistic person's life. And we say, all right, let's go brush your teeth. And you prompt the person for each step. And then when the person gets home, there's a whole other process that somebody is prompting them to do and so on and so forth. So what we're doing is that we're telling the person there is no process. You have to listen to me because none of this is making sense. Visual supports tell and give that structure and predictability that person needs. And as I had said, you know, what is really getting in the way of helping people become independent is that we're not giving them the tools to be as independent as they possibly can. So structure for independence and success. And, you know, the other thing I want to say here, just jump in, um, is the fact that we were not given any sort of manual or how-to book on raising our children. So don't take any of this personally, because I have had to learn from the very beginning all of this information, and I have been training on it for 25, 30 years. My son is going to be 40. And it's like, I still forget things. And I'm like, <laughs> you know? so, um, you know, looking at structure for independence is give the worker the understanding of the work expectations in a visual format. Uh, calming, when the worker understands the environment that reduces the distractions or possible agitation. We know that the structure predict, uh, structure for independence, uh, the person is able to learn more easily. The visual cues help the worker focus on the relevant information, whether it's a worker, it's a student, it's a um, it's a college student, it's a person, you know, um, just put in worker, put in in that um, what you will. Structure is the prosthetic device that will help a person with autism achieve independence. Let's just hear that one more time. Structure is the prosthetic device that helps the worker achieve independence. It would be similar to saying a person, um, a person who has a physical disability, they are in a um, an electronic or a motorized wheelchair, and they go to the steps of work or their school, and they say, "Well, you need to get up the stairs." I mean, that is like, well, access to this building means you need to build a ramp. That's the prosthetic device. So structure for a person with autism using visual supports is that prosthetic device that's going to help that person achieve independence. What we know is also structure in a visual format is a form of positive supports. It teaches the person with autism what to do and then generalizes the behavior through visual systems. And visual systems, when I say that, I'll get into that. Visual systems doesn't always mean pictures, doesn't always mean um, just words. It doesn't mean, I mean, it could be a multitude of things that we can help a person understand. It could be an object. It could be, like I said, a list. It could be um, abstract pictures. It could be real pictures. It could be, um, like I said, there are many ways to um, differentiate uh, how a person, and that's through an assessment process that you figure out if that person is able to do a task without needing prompting, then you know that visual is working. 
So this was something that I did just um, for a, a young man who was, <laughs> it was interesting because he had lived, um, he's a person who has autism and intellectual disability. And most, um, uh, one of his biggest barriers is that he had um, aggressive behavior and self-injurious behavior. Aggressive behavior specifically related to sensory um, and auditory uh, defensiveness, especially around crying children or babies. And he became, he had had a history of becoming very aggressive towards children and babies. It's not that when you think about that aggressive, and of course you do not want that to ever happen to your child or anyone's child, but the fact that his, his sensory processing was so acute, the only way he knew how to um, get rid of that sound was to engage in that rather than having or teaching him how to remove himself or to put headphones on. Um, what he was being told for many years is um, don't hit, don't hurt, which I mean, it did not address what his barrier was, is that he had sensory processing difficulties. So if you don't understand what's going on, you sometimes can literally be part of the problem. And so that's just a little history about this young man. And I was able to uh, customize a job for him. One of the things he loved to do with his family is to go to, um, I mean, he loves anything that has to do with uh, class A motorhomes, loves a motorhome, prefers class A, but any motorhome will really do. And what he, I mean, what he really wanted more than anything was he wanted to go look at the bathroom facility in these motorhomes. I mean, that was his big deal. I customized a job for him at a uh, an RV center. And one of the jobs that I created for him was that he um, he did touch-up work. Um, when it, when the, a new RV would come in, there was touch-up work that needed to be done on the outside, like um, touch-up paint, um, and others was washing windows, washing the outside, making it presentable for display. Um, at the end of the day, at the end of his work day, or at the, let's just, yeah, let's, the end of the day, it really was the end of the day. What do you think was his payoff? You know, because I can tell you it wasn't a paycheck. What was it, what was the motivating factor for this young man um, to do a task, to do a job. Any ideas? What he wanted to do more, most than anything is I set up a schedule for him. And after he was able to complete, we started with one uh, motorhome and then he was able to go check a bathroom in, in that motorhome that he just cleaned on the outside. After... Um, after literally about two weeks, he was literally cleaning anywhere between eight to 10 RVs on a three hour shift. Because at the end of that three hour shift, guess what he wanted to do? What was intrinsically important for him, what was part of that repetitive, um, restricted, uh, restrict, restricted, <laughs> I can't say that really quick. Restricted repertoire of behaviors, that second dyad of impairment is that pattern is that he wanted to look at toilets. That was what he had that preoccupation with bathrooms. So we were able to get him a job around something that he had interest in, gave him uh, activities that were very motivating that he was able to complete a job based on um, what was gonna be for him a great payoff. And that was something done in a very designed way. And so for this person, another person is, what does my day look like? So it would be, I'm going to get on the bus. I'm going to clock in. Um, when I get to work, I'm going to go to the, uh, to the waiter state, uh, the servers, um, the restaurant server station. I am going to fold napkins. I am going to help set the table. I'm going to clock out and then I'm going to go back home. That gave a complete view of what that person was going to be doing um, through their through their shift. What is also important is um, 
I'll actually I'll get into that here in just a second. Um, more structure for independence and success is obviously providing age appropriate cho uh, chore lists. You know, what's what should we expect at a, a person at the age of between two and three, four and five, six to ten, ten to fifteen? Um, we need to by prompting or having the person not engage in um, family chores is the effects of learned helplessness. When we jump in and help a person, what we are actually telling them is you're not capable. And it really offends that person's um, self-esteem. And it is something that it takes a while to uh, recoup, um, if ever. Um, and this is just uh, a quote from a uh, consultant that um, that I've worked with for years. His name is David. Um, Petoniak, and he's out of Blacksburg, Virginia, and he has this very slow talking um, way of speaking, and um, he has kind of a southern a southern aspect to his um, uh, vernacular. And he he would say, "It's not all about you, darling. It is you need to be jumping in. You need to be helping out." And that's he said, "Our we need to start at a very early age," and. The idea of what ableism is, and if you're not familiar with um, with this concept, is ableism is the the concept that a task can only be done by abled body people. Ableism is saying you're not capable um, because we're not giving them the information, the structure, the the technology that they're able to complete something on their own, that we think the person isn't able to do it, that only able-bodied people are able to do it. That is a uh, uh, a, for, a form of prejudice, which is referred to as ableism. So just by a show of hands, if you could, again, um, humor me, is... Um, how many of us, how many of you write a to-do list or a grocery list? After this activity, it'll be time for a break. Oh, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I would be lost without my Google Keep right. list on my phone or the sticky notes or anything. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 exactly. Um, whoops, come back here. Yeah. So most of us have said, you know, yeah, we either have a to-do list because if we don't have a to-do list, what we have to think is stop in the middle of the day. Okay. Now what was I supposed to be doing? How many of us are going to forget if we don't write it down? If we write it down, you go back to what I said, it helps to calm us. It helps us stay on track. We can cross up what we've done so that we can go to the next piece. And if you've ever gone to the grocery store, specifically when you're hungry, how many of you go to the grocery store for milk and bread and you come back with everything but milk and bread? I'd be one of those because I didn't have a grocery list. And it's funny because I, I do write things on my hand because I, inevitably I'm going to, I I have a son that's 40, you know, that I'm, I'm getting over the 60, um, 60 year old level that I forget things and I've got to write things down. So what purpose do these serve? Well, like I said, it helps us understand what am I supposed to do, where it's supposed to be done. It gives us the information so we don't have to think about it in our heads all the time. Because what that does is just drives us, it's nuts. And the other thing I give an example of is when, if you've ever gone traveling, you're going by um, by um, by plane, and that you're flying, you're getting ready, um, you're going into SeaTac or wherever you're located near, and um, you thought you got there on time, and then you look at TSA and is backed up, and is you know it looks like the the line has, and I have done this actually at um, PDX, which is in Portland, they had one of the terminals was completely shut and it was going to take two hours to get through to TSA. I was like, holy cow, I'm never going to take this my flight. Fortunately, I did. But um, how many times are you looking at your watch or are you looking at your ticket? 
how many times you okay now you're you've gotten through tsa are you going to look at your ticket again now what gate am i at uh what terminal am i supposed to be going on why is that your executive function has just been derail derailed um by your fight flight or freeze you're not able to recall that information because it's just gone to your extremities it's a um prehistoric instinct that that's what we do when we are in a frightful situation. We go into fight, flight, or freeze. And having a visual, such as a airline ticket, is going to tell you the gate, the terminal, the gate, and the time it leaves. Um, so on that level, uh, on that note, why don't we take just a five-minute break, Amelia, and um, I'll be back. What? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so set up your workstation. Um, that person might need to know is how much work. Well, we're going to either that's going to be something that we can put an alarm on or like the job coach um, could also help with the person uh, set a time timer. So the person needs to know a need for speed and accuracy. How much does a worker need to complete in order in the amount of time that he is she or given or their schedule allows or that their shift, um, how long their shift is that they're supposed to get a certain amount of work done. This does, um, inter, um, it does obviously cause problems with the person's quality of work or productivity. The concept of time passing, again, using a time timer, um, an alarm set uh, so the person knows um, there are ways that we can tell the person how much work. Another thing would be is uh, for this person that, you know, what does finished look like? How do I know uh, when I'm done? So we know that they're going to go to work. Um, they're going to work until nine o'clock. <clears throat> We've got it. Um, use the complete um, uh, or use a complete stack of uh, tablecloths as an indicator that you need to complete these within your time frame of working. Or it could be these, uh, this silverware needs to be empty as a way of telling the person, how do I know when I'm done? So when the napkins have all been rolled and the silverware is gone, that's how I know I when I'm done. Or it could be, I know I'm done because my shift is over. I am done <clears throat> because I've worked consistently for the uh, six hours I was working my shift then you know by alarm that um, I work until uh, nine o'clock and my shift is over. So how does this person know? When am I done? And we there are a lot of people with autism, again, looking at that second um, pillar of the diet of impairment, that restrictive repertoire behavior is, are, there are have been, and oftentimes a lot of folks that I've worked with is they want to stay until they complete something. They don't want to stop. They want to complete it, complete it. And it takes a lot of um, effort for the person to stop because again, that's shifting their, their thought process. I'm going to do this and then I'm going to leave. And then I have to come back to it. So there are, there are ways I'm not going to get into that um, today because um, that's a whole other training. So um, knowing how to help a person uh, know that it is time to be finished, whether it's completed or not, there are ways that we can also show that person the concept of when we're done. The other thing is, what do I do next? You know, an icon at the end of the uh, the work, uh, the task list could say, you know, go back to your schedule. It's going to tell you, you've clocked in, you've gone to the, um, <clears throat> the service station, you've rolled the, um, the silverware, and now it's time to set the table. So that's tell the person, and then you would have a different work system that would actually show the person step-by-step, step, how do I do, how do I set the table? And technology is is a is a beautiful thing. <laughs> there, are thing there are ways that, um, and there are apps that are no to low cost that can help a person understand what are the steps. And it could be 
literally the practical piece of taking the picture and uploading it into this app that it would you could actually say this is the what I'm supposed to be doing and the time frame I'm supposed to be uh, completing it in. So there are ways that we can use technology. There is a way that we can use pictures and lists. There are a lot of things that we can do um, that we can help a person, you know, initiate and complete a task without using prompting. And that takes effort on our part because that that's who needs to change. It's whether it's you or I as being parents, it's as a teacher, a job coach, whoever, this is the person who is who has a um, a neurological disorder. It's um, by giving them access to learn and to um, to develop independence. It's that we need to instruct in a different way, coach or mentor in a visual way, so that person is able to complete a task independently. Um, like I said, it might be. <clears throat> these are some of the things that. Division Teach at a Chapel Hill, in North Carolina, uh, talks about, and that is <clears throat> basically the daily schedule. Excuse me, I need to take a drink. A daily schedule tells the person what they're going to be doing throughout the day. Many schedules or routines tells the person how to do those tasks within my daily schedule. A calendar tells me how many times <clears throat> in this week or how many times this month am I going to go to work or I go to school or when I have a day off or when there's no school. A choice board <clears throat> gives a person options of making choices. Because if you go back to that um, diet of impairment, a person with autism has difficulty making choices, um, initiating a choice, understanding with executive function, how do I organize what my choices even are? Because oftentimes what happens is the person, you know, if you were to say, what do you want for lunch? Peanut butter and jelly. Because that's the only thing that they know how to respond to. They don't even know what, is there anything else that I can request? So if you have a choice board, similar to what they would have in a, in a restaurant, what are my options? Because if you went into <clears throat> spaghetti factory and say, you know, I'd like to have, um, uh, enchiladas they're going to say i'm sorry that's not on our that's not on our menu it's like that's what i want well you're in the long <laughs> wrong location so having a choice board gives that person the ability to make choices um telling a person when we don't talk that there's no communicating or there's no talking um and then there are like uh, other things that are people locator i set up a um a piece of technology and there um a family there was a young man uh who had down syndrome <clears throat> and an autism spectrum disorder that uh got him a job at a distribution center it was a hundred thousand square foot distribution center massive and obviously the family was uh concerned that he was going to get lost and he might get upset etc so we use something that's called geofencing and that we um the the employer purchased something that basically helped um the job coach and his employer know where he's at at all times so if he needed help he had his basically his um his red button that it was he needs help that he could do that and in just you know within a couple of seconds or a few seconds <clears throat> they had him located specifically right then the other thing is you know having a person be able to ride a bus i know um <laughs> i have grandchildren and that um my grandson he has his cell phone and you know they have a locator on him <laughs> so they know where he's at at all times so it's, it is a good thing. It is something that we can use um, to help a person um, that we can help them without always being with them. And it's just a way of recognizing what are those, what are the barriers? How can we help? How can we put things in place? Because I've told them over and over again, and we're not getting to the point of the person being able to do it independently. What can I do in, instead? 
So for instance, this would be a fast food employee vocational task. And if you've ever worked at a fast food uh, restaurant, guess what they have? They have a step-by-step, -step, how do I assemble a crispy fish sandwich with tartar sauce and lettuce? Well, this is the process that you would take. Um, that would be something that you could use even at home. How do I, how's your loved one, whether it's an adult or a child, make their own sandwich? Um, it could be, there's a lot of things that we can do is help a person learn the process by putting things in, um, in a basket so that they're learning to build a sandwich or um, build whatever they need to, whether it's a taco, it's a sandwich, whatever. There's a process and that's something you know, obviously we can take from our fast food friends is there is always a process and a procedure. For heaven's sakes, if you've gone into any bathroom <laughs> at any place, it gives you a step-by-step -step process of how to wash your hands. Why do you think that's necessary? Because people have different ideas of what their employer are asking of them. Because what they might think of washing their hands is rinsing it under warm water is not what the employer means is by washing your hands, you turn on the warm soapy, you get your water warm, have soapy, make suds, rub your hands, then rinse it thoroughly and then uh, wipe it clean. And all employees must wash their hands before they return to work. Why do we need to tell that? Because people forget, they get in a hurry. I just need to run in the bathroom and I get back to work. Oops, I forgot to wash my hands for the 20 seconds that it was required. We need these reminders. And that is no different from the people that um, have, uh, who are not neurodiverse and have difficulty with organizing and sequ sequencing a problem, especially when they're under stress or any sort of anxiety, they get into fight, flight, or freeze and they're not able to complete something. <clears throat> So here's um, here would be a task um, that I've set up for other um, uh, workers in um, is just bit by doing a matching process. And this is by matching template on a, a store shelf so that a person can identify the number of cards that are needed. I just started working with a, a, a young man who works for Jimmy John's. He has Down syndrome and autism. And what he has is a task list and he knows by crossing them off, he can go to the next um, next item on the task list. And as a concrete literal thinker, he understands that if I cross it off, I'm done with it. But there was another piece to it that he didn't understand is that you have to complete this task before you can cross it off. And he was saying, no, I crossed it off. So it's done. So that's a concrete thinker. It's like, uh, no, you have to do that before. So now it's like, okay, we need to backpedal because we don't have enough information for this person to know what finished looks like. And um, we're going to get into a power struggle. That's not going to be uh, beneficial to anyone. Um, something like this, uh, this is called on the right-hand side is called a first then. And that's basically a morning routine um, that you can put into place. Like I said, you could take a picture and upload, you know, um, that I, I wake up, I'm going to have breakfast, brush my teeth, go to school, go to work, et cetera. Um, that tells the person uh, using technology in a way that uh, I would say electronic technology, because actually a piece of paper with a checklist is also um, assistive technology because it's a it's an assistive device or piece of paper that tells the person that these are the tasks I do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, when I come into work, these are the things that I do. Again, kind of going back to our retail friends, if you've looked at like going into Albertsons, and it's funny when you get in into this business, I look for all these things and it's like on the outside of the door, it's like, when was this bathroom cleaned last? How many of you look at that? I know I do. <laughs> it's just like, oh, that's important stuff. Um, why would we have that there? There is a likelihood 
that there would be some people that would just skip that as part of their job. But when we put something that's visual in that regard, it has to be the date, the time, and their initial because their employer wants to see that they've con um, they've completed the job and it becomes part of the job of the individual um, that's doing the task. Another thing, again, a note, another thing to notice is Amazon. When they deliver to your house now, they take a picture of it. They've taken a picture that they have delivered and that there needs to be proof that they've completed the task. And why do we know that? Why do we know that that's important is, you know, when there are what I call porch, uh, porch bandits, we have um, people, unfortunately, that are, are not um, trustworthy who are, you know, had been Amazon employees that were taking packages. So it is a process of knowing that something has been completed. And again, just tapping into our retail fan, um, um, retail friends that we can take a lot of that information and apply it to everyone because actually visual supports is a universal design for learning concept. Everyone with the, with the exception of those who are blind needs universally designed visual supports to be as independent as possible. Other things that we can use to help a person, like for instance, one of the things, uh, one, the picture uh, using a time timer tells the concept of time passing. Another thing we could use as an impulse control is help, uh, help a person understand uh, social emotional regulation because sometimes people don't even understand that they have gone through a process that got them to the point of being calm to all of a sudden, I'm about to lose my mind. So we can help a person understand what are some of the levels, what it feels like, and what I can do for myself. Because otherwise, somebody's going to, well, and how helpful is it when someone says, calm down, you need to calm down. How does that go? I mean, how is that effective for you? Because I can tell you that just gets me right about to that five where it, it's that looks, sounds like someone about to lose their, their mind. I love Somebody that I, when my husband says that. Oh, right. It's like, I know I, my husband oh. does the same thing. Yeah. Because you said that I will. <laughs> oh, right. It's like, yeah, I hear you. I know. And I know how to calm down because I'm all excited right now. My anxiety is about over the, you know, the top and you're telling me to do something. It's not going to happen. <laughs> you're right. And another way is to be able to list what are the anger rules? You know, it's okay to be angry. And that's teaching a person, a perspective from somebody else's point of view is, um, don't hurt others. Um, we don't hurt yourself. We don't hurt property. And what we need to do is talk with somebody about how you're feeling. We can also show a person things that um, that are uh, concepts that are hard to describe, like keep personal space. What does personal space mean? Well, again, going through COVID, we noticed that there were little X's on the floor that showed us what six feet apart was. Why do you think we had, why do you think uh, our retail friends did that? Or not even retails, could be medical office, et cetera. Is because people weren't following the protocol or the rules or just didn't even know what is six feet. You know, six feet could be, you know, 20 feet apart for some person. And while another is just like, I'm almost sitting on your head, um, they think that they're they're keeping their personal space. Well, in this regard, you could have something in a very visual, functional way is in this regard is what does it look like is when I talk to other people, sometimes I stand too close. So that's a perspective from somebody else's point of view. I need to remember to step back and leave some space. People don't like it when I stand too close. It's not polite to stand too close. It's polite to respect other pre people's personal space. I leave them an arm's length between people when I talk. So that is giving a person um, basically information on what does it mean to have personal space? Instead of saying to a person, oh, you're too close, you're too close. What is the concept of too close and how do we help the person describe what personal space means and what people are, are inferring? 
So there are ways that, again, that we can um, help define an underlying concept that um, there's a lot more inference to it than concrete information. We can put it in a visual way so that there is concrete details. So another thing I have here is the rule of conversation, you know, smile, uh, turn and face the person you're talking to. I'm not saying make eye contact because that's not, especially for people, um, autistic people, they don't like to, oftentimes don't like to make eye contact. So don't make a person look at me um, in the eyes or look at my face. It could be the person's just, I'm in your direction. Um, ask uh, the rules of cons conversation could be, I'm going to ask a question or I'll wait for somebody else to make question, uh, uh, to ask a question. Um, it says when you are conversing, it's good to make eye contact, but it doesn't mean I need to have a laser beam on them at all time. It means I am making, and that would be something that I would need to describe even more. It's, um, um, I, I just keep thinking of trainings and things that I've gone to because, you know, uh, um, I'll get through this, it, you know, taking turns, we need to share conversations um, and we need to stay on topic. These are things that we can help a person understand, you know, if I want to talk with somebody, this is what I need to do. Uh, a, a young man that was a transition student that I was working with, um, he, um, he actually had a, another student, a female student that put a protection order against him. And that was because he didn't understand the rules of conversation, didn't understand personal space, and he didn't understand uh, the social rules of making eye contact because he would get too close. He would, if he was in the cafeteria, he would see her and he would literally push through people and just be within probably a foot of her and just stare at her. And she, not knowing that this is, you know, this is something that we need to help this person understand rather than saying, get away from me, you're just being... And that's what happened is she said, get away from me and put a protective order. Her family put a protective order on him um, because he was being creepy. And indeed he was being creepy. Um, and that was the perspective that he was, um, that the individual was sharing. And by providing a person with basically what the social, you know, social thinking is, um, I was able to help him understand, you know, what it is when, like, for instance, his um, the, what he wanted more than anything in this world was to have a girlfriend. And so he thought he was on the, his mission to find a girlfriend by, you know, being at every corner that she turned here, he was within, you know, 12 inches from her and staring at her and not having any way to even to start a conversation because he didn't know where to start. And when I started working with him, I asked him, let's say his name is Jason. I said, Jason, if you um, had a girlfriend, what would be the first thing? What would you do on your first date? And he said, we'd go skinny dipping. I was like, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> but he had watched movies with his sister, with his family, and you know, watching these romance movies or whatever. That was his perspective of what dating was. And obviously in that, Having that perspective, it did get him in trouble. Um, he had a uh, protective order against him. And there were other uh, subsequent uh, situations before I started working with him that police were involved. Um, we don't want, um, we have an opportunity to help people understand, you know, instead of saying, you know, um, you know, stay away from Sally, she doesn't want to talk with you. It could be the perspective from somebody from Sally's point of view is when you get too close, it makes her feel uncomfortable and she thinks you're creepy. I mean, those are some ways that we can help a person understand through social narratives um, what we mean by underlying concepts that we infer. And yet the person with autism, understanding that their primary diagnosis based on the diet of impairment is social communication. And when just because a person is able to talk, people make um, do the misjudgment that they also understand social rules 
social concepts, things that is basically what identifies him as having a neural uh, divergent disability. Some of the other things um, to think, think about, especially with a person, and that could be within the uh, re uh, restrictive repertoire of behaviors is the, the distractibility that using visual supports, um, again, using graphics to reinforce a text so a person can, can literally look at something and get refocused. You can color code things, underline, circle, highlight the important information in text directions or notes. You can use a flow chart. This is uh, actually the young man that I was working with at Jimmy John's. I had to give him a flow chart that showed who, who his boss was, I mean, who the owner was, who his bosses were, who was the supervisor, and who does his job coach um, is accountable to that she can help him because she did, he had a different uh, mindset and he didn't understand really what is the process of who my who who are my um, supervisors. Um, illustrate ideas, like I said, as a picture, an idea, a concept, those need to be put in a format that a person's going to understand that. Provide written uh, directions, whether um, it could be written, it could be visual. Um, we also know that visualized facts um, to be memorized aren't always going to be recalled with a person who has ex executive function uh, processing problems that they want to have a list that they can check from. Trace or rewrite important words, facts, or definitions. That there is a there is a uh, process of learning of not only seeing it by having a um, a kinesthetic process of rewriting important words, facts, or definitions, or writing over those words can have a more lasting um, effect for a person although they still need to refer to the visual, just like you or I do our to-do list or our grocery list. And then to help a person with distractibility, we need to understand that many people with autism, actually all of us do, have some sort of uh, sensory processing uh, disorder. Like for instance, I can tell you when, um, like when I'm trying to talk on the phone and my dog has now, I mean, he's losing her noodle, barking at the Amazon man at the door. I can't seem to function or even, and I just want her to be quiet. And I have to tell her to go to her kennel because I can't think straight, literally. Um, some of those, and you know, some of those things that we talk about, oh, I just can't think straight. We have to think about what is it? Why can't I think straight? Well, it could be that I've got a car full of Girl Scouts or I've got, you know, my grandchildren in the back seat and I'm taking them to the zoo. I've got the music on loud and all of a sudden somebody slams on their brakes in front of me. Um, I want everybody to be quiet because my ability to process information has now been overloaded and I just need quiet. So those are some of the things that we can do to help the, our loved ones or people that we work with, you know, again, the vi uh, visually sequencing the steps, the, the, um, the uh, exercise that we did of brushing your teeth, that we can say, these are the steps. And instead of telling the person how to do it, we refer them and reference the visual steps. Oh, it looks like you're in step one. Let's do step two. Can you tell me where we need to start with step three? So you can see that I'm helping him facilitate, he or she facilitate the process by facilitating, I need you to look at this to know what to happen next. Because if I'm prompting that person, they're not gonna look at their visuals because they don't need to. And they won't learn that I can get more information by following a sequential visual support. In the top left, again, is one of those process of, you know, our retail friends that have our restaurant um, owners that have, you know, the process of washing your hands. Um, you know, Trevor gets dressed, you know, Trevor has something that shows, you know, he's got Velcro um, icon that he goes from left to right that shows that he's completed this task. Um, you know, 
uh, people who use um, pill minders, you know, that they, you know, for their week that they have a afternoon and a morning uh, dose that they need to take. Well, they've got a pill minder that tells them because you get, you know, let's say it's, you're going to bed and it's like, did I take those? I can't remember. Did I take my morning medicine? This helps us remember those things because you've had a whole day go by or it could be literally, you know, a half hour and you're like, I don't remember if I did that or not. So these are ways that not only that we use as ways to help us remember and to keep track of what we're doing, that's even more important for um, the autistic people in our lives. We talked about color coding. It could be a padlock has a yellow dot on it with matching yellow keys. It could be um, a visual matching. Actually, I have to tell you, I, I've just um, recently finished my master gardening course through um, Washington State University here in Van Vancouver, which is where I live. And I am helping redesign their tool shed using universal design for learning. And I'm using the visual matching aptitudes or um, outlines so that anybody that comes in, whether they have a disability or intellectual disability or whatever, that they know exactly where to put things. And you don't have a big pile on the desk because somebody comes in and like, I don't know where this goes. So I'm just gonna set it here. This is helps the person become more independent, uh, feel, have a feeling of accomplishment. Um, if you're looking through something and it's like, oh, I have to take every key and I'm going to put it into every one of these padlocks until I find the one that fits or your color code, the keys and put them on the padlock. That's going to really shorten time and help the person get the dock, get the lock open. You know, those, again, just looking at the, you know, the independent visual work reminders. How many of you use post-it notes? I've got post-it notes literally on my dashboard in the car. I've got them on my bathroom window, a bathroom mirror, excuse me. Um, I have, I actually have a pad beside my bed because inevitably I will wake up and go, oh, I'm going to forget to do that if I don't write it down. <laughs> so I have, I have coping mechanisms that I know that I need to put in place because I am going to forget. I get over, you know, I have a lot of, you know, irons in the fire and I'm going to forget things. So the visual work system teaches, it helps teach the system for a person who has problems with organizing and sequencing, knowing when, where to start um, and when something's completed. The system typically goes left to right, which is a pre-reading um, uh, skill that we put in place for, you know, that we have for our children, because that's what our culture, um, that is how our culture is set up. Our reading um, is that we go from left to right. You might go to um, another country and they go right to left. But in our case, we go to left to right because it is a pre-reading um, skill. Have a finished basket or have something that tells me that I have completed it, whether it's marking it off, whether it's moving an icon from one side to another, whether it is by using my um, electronic device that uh, literally you push the button and it it just goes away. I mean, it's um, it disappears. So there are things that can help us know that we have completed. What does finished look like? The schedule needs to include what's next. So if I'm, I've completed my task and it says at the bottom, check your schedule, that takes you right back to where you need to be. Tasks have a clear beginning and end. Only materials needed for the task are visual. And then the instructions are Use nonverbal prompts only, such as gesturing, pointing. Um, step away from the individual whenever possible so that what that's going to do is help the person, one, complete a task on their own, and two, uh, help them initiate asking for help. Because what I have worked with and what I have done is regardless of where they are on the spectrum, is that a person, if they don't know what they what to do, they'll either ignore it or they'll walk away from it or they'll only try a part of it and not complete it. This is human nature. And this is a way that we can help a person understand um, what does it mean? How do I initiate a task? How do I ask for help? 
Um, the other thing is don't take work apart in front of a student or a worker or individual. Um, that was, the, and why I say that is because there used to be a history of sheltered workshops that um, a person with any um, intellectual disability um, and or autism with a co-occurring um, intellectual disability that they would have them do certain tasks, uh, putting a widget into, uh, you know, a, a jig. And then when they were finished, they would just empty the box and have them do it over again. That was, oh, so that's why I put that in there. Um, not that people would do that now because how disrespectful can you be to anyone? And then schedule is used to tell the student really what to do without them saying, it's time for you to go to lunch. It's time for you to do this. It's gonna tell them what time it's whether, uh, what time, where am I gonna go? It's through technology, through visual, through alarms, whatever it is, there are ways that people can be as independent as possible. You know, key to understanding communication needs is when we know that someone displays challenging behaviors like avoidance, um, um, typically we need to step back and really think, what are they, what are they trying to say with their behavior? You know, our job, Ed, whether we're a parent, an instructor, um, a teacher, a job coach, um, a college professor, is that we need to help them express themselves in a way that they learn how to get their needs met without needing to engage in negative behaviors. And that could be similar to what I had presented before is by helping them understand with a social story that, you know, uh, what are the rules that these are the rules that we follow and the perspective could be um, uh, what I need to ask for help. I can ask my, my coworker, I can ask my, uh, my supervisor. Um, when I am at work, I keep my hands to myself. I, or I can say there are certain people I need to ask. I had a, a guy that worked at Home Depot and that's what the job coach would do is she started a, a fade process so that this person could be working independently without any adaptations or supports. And so I was called in to help them design these things. And basically what he would do is he would look, I mean, he would be looking for a supervisor and he wasn't, wasn't anywhere in sight. So he would just go sit down or he would go to the lunchroom. He wasn't persistent in finding them. So I said, what could happen is that there could be a communication center where the supervisor can write down the things that he needs to do, cross them off. And then at the bottom, there is a, um, he can text the, the supervisor, I need help, or what do you want me to do next? So we gave that person all the things, um, especially regards to his executive function, that he's not going to get himself fired or misunderstood, or even labeled as being he's um, ineffective, he's lazy, um, which aren't the cases. It's just that he doesn't know how to ask for help. He doesn't know how to initiate a task. He doesn't know where to find his supervisor. And he has um, part of the executive function is critical thinking. How do I think for myself? And so these are ways that we can help individuals because that is part of their disability. It's not that the person is trying to be um, trying to be a bother. Um, we need to really understand what communication needs are. We want to avoid the uh, the power struggles. Similar to the young man that works at Jimmy John's, um, getting to the point where it was like I, I it's crossed off. I did it, and it was like. I mean, that was not a teachable moment. That was not a time where I'm going to introduce or get into and say, yes, you you know, you didn't, you got to do it because he's at work. We're going to have a um, um, an opportunity that we're going to be able to help him understand maybe through a social story or a social perspective, what it means and why he needs to complete that task. Because what happened in this regard, he didn't want to take out the, the garbage from the lobby and what happened is one of his coworkers had to go do it. And so when I wrote a, a social story that said, somebody else had to do your job in your place and they had to step away from their job, 
they weren't happy with that. And that was a perspective from somebody else's point of view. And I also, you know, also his uh, employer was not, um, was not happy with him because he didn't complete his task. It was in his mind, it was concrete. It was literal. I'm not going to do it. I don't like it. And I am concrete. I mean, not he's saying that I'm thinking I'm going to cross it off and then I'm done. So there's a black and white thinker. There's a person who doesn't like to do something, doesn't understand what the social um, social nuances to not doing a job or the social uh, perspective of somebody else's point of view when he doesn't want to do a job, or doesn't want to complete something, or if, um, you know, it could be a, a number of things, but social stories are really, um, really effective and a best practice uh, support strategy for um, anybody on that perspective, uh, on the spectrum. Relationships, relationships, relationships. If you have somebody that you are supporting, whether it's in a, um, you know, an educational position, um, job coach, um, DVR consultant, um, me as a consultant. Um, one of the things that we want to make sure is that we have a relationship. I'll give you an example of an agency that I was working with and have been working with that there is a gentleman that I have worked with for almost 15 years at different times in his life for the last 15 years because his job coaches have changed. And so um, what they have done is instead of putting the visual supports in place or learning them. They wanted him to do what they told him to do. And they wanted compliance out of him and the job coach that he'd be working with. That's exactly what she had set up. She said, before you come in, I'm just going to have him do some things. And if it doesn't work out, I'll have you, I'll help you come in and work. I said, it's not going to work. And I said, if we, it's, um, if we're going to, if we want to respect a person and their communication needs and help the person understand what is expected of them, we want to put that up on the front end rather than waiting for someone to fail before they get their needs met. Um, it's sort of like having a plain cupcake and throwing some blueberries on top and saying, that's a blueberry muffin rather than I'm making a muffin and I'm folding in my blueberries and it's all together. We had it up front because when it's baked, it comes out and it's all together. Um, it is really a process of how do we help this person address the barriers and it's not about compliance. It's about understanding and helping that person understand different perspectives, processes, and procedures because that is literally, those are literally the characteristics of their di diagnosis based on the diet of impairment. Functional communication, it's not ours. It is for the individual uh, with autism. It's how do you assess the efficacy of the, the supports is if, as if the person is using them or they're not. Uh, and we need to stop and ask what need is going unmet? Why does this person need to engage in perhaps a behavior or avoidance, whether it's aggression, where it's walking away or avoiding or not listening um, or engaging in a power struggle because those are not teachable moments. And a teachable moment is the time and opportunity when the brain and the sensory system are receptive to input. We wanna be proactive rather than reactive. Meaning like for instance, my son who is has a lot of auditory um, sensory processes uh, processing problems, such as um, someone coughing. It's um, very, it's insulting to his, um, his auditory processing. It just, it just, because he's, he has a lot of social anxiety. And so when he goes into a social situation, his anxiety now is way above baseline, probably on the cusp of getting into a crisis. So I know this is not a teachable moment. And what I want to do is prime him with information prior to going into a situation. And I'm going to give him a social story that says there are going to be people that are going to cough. And um, they're coughing because they're sick. 
we all want to go to the uh, we all want to go to the restaurant because we're all hungry, which basically gives a definition and then a perspective, and then it could be this person is hungry too, although they're sick. And so I give these social stories to Michael to prime him and prep him, because when he gets into that, you know, fight, fight, <laughs> flight, fight, or freeze, that he is going to be reactive, and he, um, and unfortunately has been very aggressive towards people. He's six one and weighs um, 210 pounds. So he can be um, a very intimidating uh, factor when we're out in the community. So I want to make sure I have all my literally ducks in a row so that he can be as successful as possible. I like this little thing. That, I mean, the mom and the son is like, let's just consider this a teachable moment and move on. <laughs> Teachable moments are very important. The other thing I hear is while well, I'm getting into their behavior, literally meeting someone's communication need does not equate to giving into a behavior. When we understand where the behavior is coming, whether it's by avoiding, walking away, it's either um, or engaging in self injurious behaviors or um, becoming aggressive, it is a way that that person is trying to communicate something and it's our responsibility to try and figure out where's where's the barrier here why does this person need to engage in a uh, negative behavior to get their his or her needs met these aren't teachable moments these are ways that we need to have um, be reflective of what are some of the barriers for this person to be successful i know for my son he needs a social story and he needs a reminder every single time we go into any social uh, situation because coughing is a big thing. The other is that he has a trigger word. And unfortunately, the trigger word is okay. Okay will literally unleash his aggression. There's a lot of you know speculation of why and I um, my my theory is that he has been asked since he was nine years old after he's had a seizure, are you okay? And I think that has just been something associated with something that is negative for him. So I give out little little plockets that says, avoid the word okay. These are alternatives because again, when a person's in a situation, it's like, uh, uh, what do I say? And it's like, you can say, all right, how does that sound? Is that working for you? So I have these little cards that are reminders so that other people have a visual so they know how to support him. I can do a social story, but again, it gets uh, to that point where his baseline of anxiety is at the, you know, the the cusp of tipping over into um, into a crisis, and so social stories, as positive as they are, um, sometimes depending on his level of anxiety, don't work, and they don't work for everybody. Communication is a two way street. Um, just because somebody says something and the person, the autistic person follows your direction and is compliant, that does not mean that there's communication. Communication is a process of, of uh, reciprocal give and take. Um, this is one of the common uh, diagnose, diagnostic characteristics of autism is a social communication disorder. Understanding communication traits of a person with autism is necessary to support them. Have increased, uh, increased the ability to have meaningful interactions, improve community life, and support independence, choice, and, and autonomy when we have the right communication, not necessarily language, but communication supports, and um, those vary based on what that person needs. Um, I'm going to skip over this because we have a couple more things. I just hear a bunch of <laughs> post-it notes. Um, just to kind of, <clears throat> again, having, you know, notes that we can look at, having a visual demonstrates the decreased level of frustration, anxiety, and aggression are related to starting or completing a task. Um, visual communication, um, when we present information verbally, the words are available for a nanosecond and they're gone. But when, when we present information in a visual format, it's there 
for whenever that individual needs to refer to it. How many of us do we like, oh, I need to refer to my notes or I need to refer to my recipe or I need to refer to my grocery, my grocery list. We need to be doing it to and for individuals that uh, our loved ones that we either support, um, educate, instruct, coach, mentor. Tells the person what's going on. And I'm not going to get into all of that. This is, I'm going to get, these are three different ways of saying the same thing and communicating in it in a different way. Up on the top right is a checklist. We're going to go to the car, grocery store, haircut, go home. Just a checklist. For other people, that might mean, people's people, it might mean I need to have, um, more generalized abstract cons uh, pictures, such as a car, a grocery uh, grocery cart um, that represent a grocery store, haircut and go home. It's the same thing as a checklist, or we're actually using actual pictures of the person getting in the, in the car that he, he or she are gonna be traveling in, going to Safeway, go to the barbershop and go home. So the values of communicating are vast and it's just our ability to put information that the person understands the concept that you're um, providing, whether it's a, a system of how to do something, whether it's a process or um, a calendar of when something's going to happen or a visual schedule that tells me what's going to happen today or a social story that tells me a perspective from somebody else's point of view or an underlining concept that tells me that I'm standing too close. These all need to be in a visual format to help that person to be like I said, as potentially uh, independent and successful as possible. Just have a few minutes and I'm going to just run through, you know, the social judgment. I have a whole training that's just on the characteristics of autism, but I do want to just provide this information. I'm not going to be going through it because um, that's something, like I said, it is its own um, training in its own, <laughs> on its own. Um, but it is, you know, the social judgment and social relating. These are the symptoms on the left and the implications of support are on the right. Making assumptions. Uh, assumptions is often uh, people with autism don't understand that people have their own thoughts, like I had mentioned, and that is referred to as perspective taking uh, theory of mind or mind blindness. And those are things that you can actually look up and get the de definition. What does that mean? And what does it mean for a person with autism and why that's important? Ah, come back here. It's gone. It has a mind of its own. Uh, I'm not assuming that an individual, um, although they might understand something today, doesn't mean they're not going to understand it tomorrow. Because depending on that level of sometimes of anxiety, sometimes of sensory processing, uh, we can't make assumptions whether that person is going to learn. Um, we have to give them basically um, information based on their worst day, not on their best day. Because what happens if they're in their worst day, people are starting to scramble when we want to help that person get as much information to address that barrier so that they don't have a worse day. You know, really the, the natural outcomes of social engagement, competitive employment, independent, or sometimes semi-independent living. Um, there's motivating, there's something that's intentional and functional. Really the objective quality of life is good physical health, mental health, good quality of neighborhoods, uh, neighborhood, frequent contact with siblings and extended family. That all takes social communication and uh, addressing how do I make friends? How do I understand the social complexities of, of this scenario? Um, how do I help? How do I connect with other people that have like, uh, liked interest, interests? <gasps> I did it. <laughs> so that's that's what I have today. I will, um, Malia, make sure that you have the handout to this presentation um, so that you can send it out to folks um, so that they have it for their reference. Um, so yeah, I only got one email, but if you um, oh. if you RSVP'd on the Facebook, I'll post it on the event there. 
that okay. it might be kind of hard to navigate to. So the preferred method is the email, but, uh, or you could just contact me later. I, okay. uh, yeah, that's fine too. <laughs> that's good Are there any questions before I, you know, we kind of drop off here? I'm going to stop recording. So sure. Yeah. Good idea. I have no questions.